tonight all right we're gonna do some tying first ja, joe looking forward to discussion on sam and me too buddy i'm um, ready for fall ready to put the spring behind us although it was great while it lasted uh hopefully we get our order here before too long we can get back to some normalcy and uh go pound some more steelhead that are still around we've got a lot of steelhead still around what's up mark good to hear in the house man what's up garrett how are you guys? I'll give you a little soundtrack. My son's new album. It's not out yet, but uh, since I'm a dad, I got a little advanced copy. So I figured I'd start you guys out with some music to start every night. I don't know. I love music. So if you look around this office, most of it's music, not not fly fishing. But uh, I know a lot of you guys that were on the river, we talk about music a lot. I love it. Um, I'm going to try to do I know. YouTube, um, you guys over here, the, the quality is not as good. I know I've tried to figure out how to make it a little better, but um, I just can't. Looks like we're having an issue over here. Let me see if I can get this going again. Hi. Are you on the internet, baby? Yeah, turn that off because I'm having trouble connecting for some reason. There we go. I think we're back. Hey, Kevin, how are you? If uh, if we jump off for some reason, shoot me a text. I don't know whether you guys can see me or not there. It looked like we were paused. but uh, All right, so let's get started with the first fly. Um, actually, the, the fly we're going to do tonight, it's the uh, Sparrow. It's a super simple fly. So here's, here's – I've said this, I think, in every program I've ever done about flies. There are five aspects that make a great fly, in my opinion. One, it's easy to tie. Two, it's quick to tie. Three, it's a durable fly. Four, I want it to be cheap to tie. And then five, obviously, we want it to catch fish. And obviously, that fifth one's number one. Um, but if you get those five aspects, to me, that's a yeah, that's a, that's the perfect fly. So, um, so a sparrow, in my opinion, for salmon and steelhead, is a uh, is a perfect fly. So we start out with a the hook is a. Uh, must add S83906 size eight, so it's a uh, it's a heavy uh, heavy wire hook that's gonna land big fish for us. Um, the th uh, thread we're using is a uh, Uni six aught olive. Um, 
you know, the uni thread is is pretty much all I use in the six aught range. So we've got a size eight, we've got six aught olive. We're gonna start off at the bend. And we are going to take so what we have here is th this pattern really is literally two materials. It's olive dubbing and it's ring neck pheasant. Um, so we're going to take the bottom part, kind of the, the after plume of that ring neck pheasant. And that's going to be our tail. Wet that thing down. It'll make it a little easier. We pinch that loose wrap pinch. That's the tail. If you have a little egg, if it's a little you know thin, then throw a little more in there. And that one was a little thin. So there we go. We're back to the bend. We're going to take hair's ear ice dub. I know that's backwards, uh, but I want to be able to see your questions. So I've got to do it that way. So it's hair's ear dubbing uh, ice dub olive. You can do caddis screen. I mean, it doesn't really make a difference. I, like you're going to learn real quickly with me that I, I, I feel like a lot of things we worry about in fly fishing and in fly design, um, man, if they're that picky, we're in trouble. Um, I don't really feel like whether it's olive or caddis green or whatever color of green it is, that it's going to make a whole heck of a lot of difference. Um, this pattern, you could probably argue pretty well that it imitates a caddis. Um, I think sometimes we get a little caught up in that too. It's just something buggy that the fish see. Um, you know, on a lot of rivers, we don't have hex mayflies, but they sure eat the heck out of hex nymphs. So, um, so we've got dubbing on there, just a good base of dubbing. Might have to go a couple here. And we're just going to work our way towards the eye. And just build that up a little. All right. Now we're going to take, again, two, two materials. That's it, other than threading the hook. Uh, we're going to take the pheasant again. So that it's a ring neck pheasant rump natural, natural color. And we're going to work our way typically about in this area down here for this feather. So that one right there is perfect. It was already sticking out like it was saying, feed me. We're going to pull that back. Until so we've got the after after fibers here. We've got the I guess the traditional more webby hackle or unwebby hackle there. We're gonna get about just about an eighth of an inch of this type of feather. Most of it's gonna be this after shaft, uh, you know, the after plumes there, but we're gonna get about an eighth of an inch of these these feathers here. We're gonna tie it in where we pulled that back. So again, if you see here, I pulled back just a little bit. We're going to tie it in right there. Work it all the way to the head, to the eye of the hook. Clip that off. I know most of you are saying right now we clipped the wrong end, and on a lot of flies it would be the wrong end. But on the sparrow, it is the right end. We're going to wrap that. Typically what I do is I wrap that twice. I tie it off. I come in with my scissors, snip it. You're going to see, hey man, I'm telling you, the crone is going to get me because the way I tie flies if I do this in public. But I lick my fingers all the time. Another thing you could do is have your have a glass of water there where you can get them wet. Um, but, you know, to me, being able to pull those fibers back when they're a little wet makes a lot of sense. And it's something I always do. And, man, I'll tell you, that's going to be a hard habit to break if uh, if we continue with this. We're going to build up the head. We're going to whip finish. I whip finish everything. I don't uh, I do not do any half hitches, um, and I don't use head cement on hardly any of my flies. So whip finish that. That's all she wrote. And that is a sparrow, or as I was – told last night that is a Robleski if it's in Polish. So I had no idea that my one of my best buddies is named after a fly. But uh, that's right, Eric. Save that good. So the good feather, which where'd it go? Right here. 
The one we clipped off, you could lacquer that, makes a good uh, hopper wing. That's right. Yep. And then this stuff that came off the bottom makes good gills for uh, hex nymphs. You know, my buddy Greg Sauter, if he's on there tonight, Greg Tyson, I appreciate that. He ties some great flies. That's a fun thing, man. There's so many people on here that they uh, – Dan, I'll answer that. Uh, Dan asked, why no head cement? Um, when you tie – I guess there are a couple reasons. When you tie as many flies as I do, it's just an extra step. And if it was needed, I'd take that extra step. Um, but it's not needed. If you whip finish a fly, you do not need head cement. I don't have flies come apart. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, I do worry about that smell that, that the head cement emits. Um, I worry about that. Number three, again, if, if you tie a good whip finish, you do not need head cement. You just don't. Now, if you're going to half hitch, then I definitely, uh, definitely would be, uh, using head cement with a half hitch, but, um, with a, with a whip finish, I don't ever use head cement. Tyler asked, uh, where do you get your fly tying supplies from? Well, since I'm a commercial tire, I order everything direct from Hairline Dubbing. Almost everything from Hairline. A few things from Umpqua, uh, Rump, um, but almost everything comes from Hairline Dubbing nowadays. Um, I, you know, there are a number of shops that treated us well over the years, and I know that I trust them to treat all my clients well. Um, four off the top of my head that are absolutely top-notch. Um, Glenn Blackwood up at Great Lakes Fly Fishing Company in Rockford, Michigan. Um, the guys down at Fly Masters in Indianapolis. Um, uh, John and, uh, and Andy over at Chicago Fly Fishing Outfitters. And uh, the guys up at DuPage uh, Fly Fishing Company. I mean, that's uh, those are the four that I, I would trust sending my grandfather to to buy stuff and know that he's going to be taken care of and given a good price and, and given good direction. You know, that's the main thing. You can order fly tying stuff from Amazon. I mean, you know, and I talked about this the first night, but I'd, I'll probably say it every night. Um, you, you can't call Amazon and find out what the river levels are. You can't call Amazon and find out what the smallmouth are eating. Uh, it's those local small fly shops that are going to give you that information. Um, so support those guys. Uh, support them. I mean, they, they need it right now. That's for sure. Um, yeah, Jake. Jake can attest the flies don't fall apart. You really, you really don't need head cement. You really don't. The, the only exception I'll make on that is if I tie a fly that builds up a, a real large head, um, or if I tie a fly that takes 15 minutes, I might throw some head cement on there. But other than that, I just don't use it. Um, hey, let's go over and we'll switch around here. Take me a second to throw everything up on the – makeshift studio we have i wish you guys could see this i know i sent some pictures to some, to some people uh we've got a number of people that work in film and uh man they'd love this uh redneck studio i got going on here with the ladder and everything to elevate but hey it works so let's flip around here and we'll uh hey we'll talk about some coho and some kings and ask questions um you know it's uh this is for you guys well, it's for me, too, because, heck, I'm bored. My wife's tired of talking to me, and so are the kids already. So it's for me, too. But, um, you know, ask questions. Let me get it switched around here. Yeah, Court, they all are really good shops. And I'll tell you what, that's one thing that we are really – in the Great Lakes region is to have some really good fly shops. And fly shops that I trust, like I said, I trust my grandpa with. Um, that's backwards for you guys on YouTube, but I think that'll be one of the few slides that has um, that has any uh, text. So it won't make any difference after just a bit. All right. Everybody hear me okay? Facebook, you guys hear me all right? All right, a couple things left over from last night. 
that I forgot to mention. Um, for you pike guys, and we had a lot of people. Yes, I lost my razor, whoever said that. I'm not even going to scroll up. I'm pretty positive that was the sparrow. But, buddy, you lived with me for two years. You know I don't shave. Um, <laughs> by tomorrow, maybe. I was out putting a new driveway in all day. We got rocks delivered. Nothing like moving 12 tons of gravel around a driveway. That's why I've got five kids. A um, couple things I forgot last night that I, that I need to mention. And uh, when I'm pike fishing or musky fishing, this is a musk. And it's just a little finger guard that uh, you know, keeps you, your finger in one piece, really, is what it does. Those textured lines that we use, man, they eat your fingers up. And without these, you are not going to strip fast enough, especially when it's hot. Um, they're super, super easy to make. My mom makes them for us. Um, but you can buy them at the shops, too. And they last forever. One other thing, watch this pike. We're going to take this fly out of the water too early. Make sure you fish that thing all the way to the Here's a perfect example of what I'm doing until it eats. That fish is already following. It's hard to see. But if you watch right about here, that's where it's going to eat. That fish followed for about 10 yards. Make sure you fish it until it eats. Don't hit that pause button like we talked about last night. The other video I wanted to show you last night, I didn't, was this pike eating a sucker. So you can see here how those fish eat from the side. Okay, see that? That's about a 30-inch pike with about a 14-inch sucker in its mouth. They eat from the side, so that's why it's so important to have those, um, have those flies that T-bone and go sideways for us. Well, because they eat from the side. They swallow head first, but they kill from the side. Bob, if... If you're talking about me looks broke, I haven't worked in three weeks hardly. So, yes, you're right, buddy. <laughs> All right. Rivers that I'm talking about here for salmon and steelhead. Um, St. Joe. St. Joe is, starts right here in flows into Indiana. Right here is where I live, South Bend, this most southern bend of the river, which is why it's called South Bend. And then it dumps into Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan is where we get all of our salmon steelhead, migratory browns, they all come in from Lake Michigan. Um, the yellow and the tipping we talked about last night, they're down in this area right through here. The cold water streams that are down a little lower. Tributary of the St. Joe. Uh, so beautiful in the fall. Um, I just can't wait to see, you know, to, to, to see the rivers light up like they do in the fall. Um, with all those giant sugar maples, just two beautiful rivers that really get very good king and coho salmon runs. Uh, for the most part, we're using a switch rod or a nine, um, 10 and eight is fine. I would not drop below an eight and I wouldn't go above a nine. Um, but there's no, there's nothing wrong with it. We've got what about six months for, till salmon season. So if you start lifting weights now, you're going to be ready. We'll be on the Joe, start around September 11th, and then we go until mid-October or so. Um, your famine run for us. If they're in, back. hold on. If they're not in, and some years they're really not. Last year, I think I landed three coho the whole fall. This next video is two years ago. By that they're really in. This is not, this is not Alaska. This is the St. Joe River. There were that many coho. And what I did here was I took my GoPro and I tied it to a plastic big two liter bottle. And I just sub kind of submerged it about two feet under the water and let it float through these fish. And there are that many coho in when it's hot. Uh, it's a hard run to predict. It's not something I can say September 15th, we're going to go pound coho. Um, you know, April 1st, I can guarantee you, as long as we have clear water, we're going to go pound uh, steelhead. You know, June 15th, as long as we have any water, let alone clear, we're going to go pound smallmouth. Coho, I can't tell you that. But the beauty of coho is that mid-September time frame, if the coho aren't there, there is something fishing really well. And that might be uh, summer run steelhead, that might be smallmouth, that might be pike, that might be musky. 
but it also might be these great fish, the coho. So they they fight somewhere between as powerful as a steelhead, but although this one <laughs> sure is, um, but kind of in between a king and a steelhead. Uh, they're not as uh, you know, doggy, but they're not as quick and powerful. I think they're they're just an awesome fish. And like Preston said, there they're a blast on a there are. And luckily, they eat. So some of the streamers were throwing. They don't have to be giant. Um, Randall, it says, Facebook says, air loading for me. Maybe try to refresh your Facebook page, buddy. It seems like everybody's able to get on. So maybe give that a try. Um, so this fly is like two and a half inches long. Um, fishing these things is on either a sink tip with a short times we'll throw them on a floating line with a little longer bite on the same flies that you use for steelhead or you change the streamer only um so a lot of these same flies the same streamers we're using oh we're also throwing these for steelhead our steelhead stuff and this is a prime example. These are some of my, my favorite steelhead swinging flies. They're also some of my favorite coho stripping flies. So we're stripping for, for coho. We're not swinging. Typically swinging, quartering downstream and letting actively stripping. They are a lot more aggressive than it is. Um, they're phenomenal fish. The thing about the coho is that it's not an easy run for me to push around like I can some other species. But as you saw from the video, when they're in, they're in. It's awesome. And they get long. Long coho you catch out in the lake. These are big coho. And they fight really well and they're super aggressive. You know, a lot of people aren't real impressed with coho because in the spring when they're catching, you know, two to four pounds and they're just not that much fun. You kind of drag them up. But uh, when they come in the river, they're not two to four pounds anymore. They're big fish. Um, our kings come in normally at the end of September and last through no, you know, till the end of November. That fly is an anomaly, isn't it? We need to tie some of those and see if they still work. I think they have to. That was an unbelievable fly. The uh, Actually, he probably did try to patent that. September to November. Uh, this is kind of the king situation. They're big, they're powerful, the river's low, it's clear. All of those black things back there are kings. That whole black through there are all kings. This is this is an epic run. And they are powerful fish. I mean, they they will wear your butt out on a good day. Shoot, on a bad day, they'll wear your butt out. They are big, strong, mean, powerful fish. They're not as aggressive as a steelhead or a coho. Um, we're high stick nymphing them, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, you can find them in some holes and get them to eat a small swung fly on occasion, but it's not something that I spend a lot of time doing because, it's, to be honest with you, it's just not real productive. All right, high stick nymphing. This is kind of our nymphing rig uh, for kings. We've got a floating line. Uh, we've got a 9-foot, 12-pound leader down to a couple split shot. Um, so I put blood knot in there for a reason. And we, I don't care if I have a brand new leader. I cut it. I know Jake does too. We cut it. Tie a blood knot. That holds the sinkers up. So the sneakers aren't falling down below the fly. I mean, to the fly. Um, in Michigan, we can throw two flies. In Indiana, remember, we can't throw two flies. Um, what's your opinion of kings eating versus the fly? So, Dan, uh, I have caught a handful of kings swinging streamers in holes. Um, one thing that happens on our rivers is they fall out in the lake, so they don't come in real silver. Uh, the water temps are pretty high when they're staging, um, so they don't come in real bright and aggressive on our river. Um, so I don't, I don't find them attacking flies a whole lot. Uh, I find them eating nymphs primarily. I don't find them eating a lot of big streamers for us. Wish they did. It'd be awesome. So to answer that question, here's some of the flies we're using. We throw two different caddis, well, three different caddis patterns for uh, for kings. And caddis are very, very productive. 
probably my number one fly for teams. I didn't tie it tonight because we tied it the other night, but uh, uh, caddis are super productive for my king fishing. And then I forget fishing the Joe, and we've broken a king fly on. Very next cast, we throw it in. Same fish, well, we didn't know it at the time, but it was the same fish on the one of those flies was in its left corner of its mouth, and the other one was in its right. Corner. They're uh, they're not the brightest of fish. All right, hold on just a sec. Let me back this up. So what we're gonna see here is I'm gonna walk you through, and I'll probably a number of times what size on the caddis. Uh, Mustad 9672. The caddis 457. Size six or eight um, on the caddis. So here's what we're doing here. We're gonna we we kind of going. Um, here tonight, especially since we're talking about salmon. I see you up there. What's up, Declan? I hope you're on there, buddy. Hope it's not early bedtime. What you're gonna see here is your dad to show you the wrong thing to do, uh, and then. Steve did it the way he normally does it, which is perfect when it comes to when it comes to salmon. He's a so what you're going to notice here on the first drill, and that is lift the rod tip. And you but it's not called get that rod tip above the reel, and what that does is wrong. Number one, it pulls the fly constantly towards. The it doesn't allow that fly to get down to the fish. And then number three, if you a fish to eat your fly, I should say, uh, you can't get a hook set. You're going to see here, Steve is going to make a good cast here. He's going to lift that rod up against, see down in, down in his chest, but his rod tips way high. So I tell you, know, explain to him what he's doing. He knew what he was doing because this is this is staged. Declan, your dad doesn't make these mistakes. <laughs> Here he goes, perfect. Perfect cast. <coughs> Although he didn't think so on that one. This one is better. This is what we're looking for right here. We want the rod tip even with the reel and the reel coming straight off of the shoulder. That's the perfect drift. Now we've got room to get a hook set. Okay, that is the perfect drift. Two more things when it comes to salmon fishing and nymphing for salmon. Um, don't put a ton of weight on. I see so many people, well, nymphing for anything for that matter. They've got so much weight that they're basically jigging to get it off the bottom every two minutes, every two feet, I should say. Have just enough weight on that leader that it bounces a couple times through your drift. You don't have to pound the bottom for the whole drift. If it bounces a couple times through the drift, that's enough. So don't put a ton of weight on there. Also, only cast high enough upriver of the fish to get <laughs> I see you court only only cast high enough upriver of the fish to get the fly down. We don't want that fly bouncing and letting him see it for 10 feet as it comes to him. We want those fish to make a snap decision. So cast that thing a foot or two in front of the fish just enough that it needs to enough space that it needs to get down and that's all. Don't cast so far upstream. Those are the two biggest mistakes I see. People using way too much weight and people casting way too far upriver. It really messes your, your cast, I mean, your uh, drift up. Favorite colors on egg sucking leeches? I only throw two colors. I throw, uh, uh, um, sorry, black and I throw purple. As far as the heads go, I throw uh, red, chartreuse, and orange. Those are the three colors of heads. So, all right. Here's another thing that a lot of before so when that rod is so far back in the fight when it's passed basically see how far the rod is down and she's putting a ton of pressure on that fish she's got the rod double over but the reality is that fish feels no pressure at all if you don't believe me on this do me a favor and wrap the line around your buddy's hand or your wife's hand or your kid's hand and you pull the line out and once you get past this 90 degrees right here where she's at, right there, that's the power point. From there to there is where the battle's done. You get past here, there's no pressure. 
Have somebody hold that line. You move the rod, and you will see. Well, they'll see. You'll think you're putting pressure, and they'll tell you. Once you get past 90 degrees, there's no more pressure. So you often hear Jake and I say, get the rod into the fight. And what we mean by that is get real over to where if that fish is straight down river and I'm straight behind you, I can't see the rod. The fight happens from here to here. That's it. Reel over, pull back to here. Reel back over, pull back to here. Once you get past there, there's no pressure. Again, the rod's doubled over. You think you're putting pressure, but you're not. Um, Tyler, when you're using two nymphs, do you put your split shot above the fly? Okay, so yeah, legally you've got to put it above the first fly. We can't have it below um, the, the first fly. We can't have any weight below a, a lure. Glad you had fun, buddy. I'm having fun with it too. So when it comes to fighting big fish, that, that's key right there. So as we fish, a couple of them are full of logs. And everybody, if you think about it, common sense to the angler says, I've got to pull that fish away from that log. Common sense to that big 20-pound king says, I don't want to spend any energy going 20 miles an hour into a log jam and banging myself up. We lose very few fish in logs. We really do. Don't worry about pulling fish out of logs. They don't want to go 25 miles an hour into a log jam. They just don't. So very rarely do they do that. But fish will always fight against pressure. So if your pressure is going a log jam, well, if they want to go into it, there's one thing that's not the end of that log. You're not going to stop him. If you try, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to either pull the hook out of his mouth or you're going to break him off. But you won't stop him from going in that log jam. Don't even try. They're going to run against your pressure. And if you're putting pressure directly away from the log jam, they're going directly to the log jam. Hi, uh, YouTube, Randall. That might work. I know we've got four or five people on YouTube. It seems like I can't see comments on YouTube tonight for some reason. Um, let me see if they're back on here. Yeah, it's uh, not letting me see comments on YouTube. So if you're asking questions on YouTube, folks, for some reason I can't I can't answer them. I can't see them. Uh, shoot me an email or give me a call. You know, whatever however you want to get a hold of them. So here's kind of a little history, recent history on our salmon. Our our bait fish population has dropped off drastically. Although it's on the rebound now, uh, but it dropped off drastically in the alewife population in Lake Michigan. And when that happened, a lot of rivers got really hurt. For some reason, ours didn't. Um, the rivers was the size of the fish got giant the last three years. Numbers of fish have been the same. Um, you know, when the other rivers up north were really hurting, we weren't hurting for numbers of fish. We had still a lot of things. But like I said, the biggest change was that they got really, really large for us. I mean, we have seen some giant kings um, this year. And Jay Hill that's holding this fish is a big guy. And that, that is a 43-inch fish. Um, that's a 43-inch giant king. It was awesome. Hey, Bob, how are you? He makes some beautiful bamboo rods. How are you, Bob? No fish, buddy. Yeah, this fish would break your three-weight faster than I did that night outside of the Murray. All right. I want to tell a couple fish stories because people love fishing stories. Um, so this is Steve Preston. I know Preston's on there still. But we call him Sam and Steve because he is one of the few. And this fish was a massive fish. We, it took us on a boat ride down let me phrase that, a run down the river. We left the boat up river. Couldn't, because we didn't, you know, we kind of laid the net on it, but we couldn't really do it. Um, so we were kind of bummed, because we thought this was a pretty giant fish. It's king of the world, but it had a distinct issue right there. Well, a couple days later, Court, who I know is on here, uh, we, we were out fishing, and we saw this fish with that face, and mother could love and i said all right court that's the one we got to tell steve how long this thing was so court hooked it we lost it real quickly uh, again it ran upstream and went under a log jam but it went so far up past the log jam that we knew 
him. If we didn't lose the fish, it was still running. So I jumped on top of the I'm trying to feed the line underneath the logs, and I can't get it underneath. This is one of my favorite fish ever. So when I grab the line, you are going to pull line off your reel as fast as you can. We're going to get it into the backing. And Court at this point is looking at me like I'm crazy. I pull it up. I grab it. And I'm stripping line. Court's stripping line off his reel. I'm pulling line underneath the log jam. And so it's still on upstream. I bite the backing off. I pull the backing up over the backing back onto the fly line. And we land the fish. That was one of the stories that are craziest things I've ever been a part of on the river. I've done that once only that I can remember on the river, at least. This. I'll be honest, Court, you probably remember, or Preston, one of you. I don't remember how long that fish was. I know we were so happy that we caught it so we could tell Preston how long it was. Yeah. That was, that was awesome. Well, here's another one of my favorites. And uh, so Bob was having major tennis elbow issues here. and he couldn't lift the fish. So we had a name this picture. Uh, I think Bob named it the best on our Facebook page, and it was smell. Hey, one thing I forgot last night, and I don't want to forget tonight, and uh, and that is the most important thing every night with this, and uh, hopefully you'll stay around and I'll switch some pictures and tell some different kids' stories every night. But look, here's the thing. We've got to get kids. Every kid is home right now from school, bored. Be out in a heartbeat. If you said, let's go for a walk in the woods, they'd be in a heartbeat. Uh, we have got to get kids out on the Just that simple. There's nothing like the smile you're going to see here in a second from Jason. This was his first steelhead on a switch rod. That's Jake netting it. I wish I'd turned the video, the audio up. Let's see if I can do that. There he's got her. There he's got her. There he's got her. <laughs> Watch this nice smile. Work, buddy. Yes. That's what it's all about right there. We've got to get kids into that. He'll never forget that as long as he. And there he is on his first swung steelhead. That was awesome. And where else do you take a kid to hug a salmon? The river, right? It's, it's the only place. All right, one thing about taking kids fishing. This is my oldest. I don't know if Nick's on there tonight or not. Um, I, I would take Nick on what I should have called the Yellow River Death Marches uh, for Pike. We would fish way too often for a little guy, although he loved it. He ended up growing up loving it. He ended up a bit. But honestly, I should have ruined him. Uh, don't take kids on 10-hour float trips. That's not the way to get a 10-year-old involved in the sport. Take them out. Fish, turn some rocks over on a trout stream and show them the caddis underneath the rocks. Stream and turn some rocks over and catch some crayfish with them. They often want to fish, but they want to just have fun with dad or grandpa or whoever it is that's taking them. Make sure you have fun, not just catch fish. To a kid, really, all they want to do is spend time with you. That's really what they want to do. Well, Nick, thank goodness he ended up loving to fish. I was, I should have ruined him. Um, I think, Eric, you were on that trip. Actually, sure that's on our pack trip up in Montana. For us for a few years before he became a you know, world-renowned musician. It's super important, man. You've got to get your kids out fishing and, and spend time outdoors. And Nick, I, like I said, I should have ruined him. I really should have. But I thank God he loves to fish. I always love to tell a story about when I took Colleen the first time. She's my 18-year-old. And I took her the first time trout fishing. And we've got a trout stream, trout night, that is a trout. It's the the fish are always doing what they should be doing. The bugs are doing what they should be doing. And the fish aren't big. You're not going to catch a bunch of fish. And it's just the perfect trout classroom. So I took her up there. We got the waders on. She's probably 10 at the time, maybe eight, somewhere in there. And we're catching some little browns. And I'm taking the you know rocks. And I'm showing her the caddis and the mayfly nymphs. And there's caddis coming off. And the 
you know, the little 10 inch trout are eating them and we're catching them. And I feel like perfect dad, like this, I nailed it with her. I know she's going to love this sport. So about an hour into it, she looks at me. She says, Hey dad, these things we're wearing, what are they? I'm like, well, see our, yeah, those are waiters. You know, that's, you know, they're, they're waiters, which I thought was a weird question because she's grown up around guides all of her life. I mean, half the people that, that have guided for us live with us probably more than half. Um, and she's lived with guides all of her life. Uh, so I, I thought that was kind of a funny question, but she's like, no, I know what they're called, but what do they do? I'm like, yeah, honey, they, they keep the water out. They keep you dry, right? She's like, yeah, mine don't work. And she was just soaked, absolutely just soaked. But she spent an hour or two out there fishing, didn't complain. I didn't even know she was wet. She was having a blast. That's the way to do it with the kids. Make sure they're having fun. It's not all about catching fish. And when they say they're bored, they've been bored a long time and they're ready to go home. Um, you know, don't keep them out any longer. So I got lucky. Like I said, Nick loved the fish. But one of the great things about getting your kids into fishing is get more fishing time. So that's that's the pinnacle. She's also teaching them to row. Over here. Hold on, I'll be right back. Facebook. Two guys. All right, what questions do we have? True story, Tyler. The poor girl was soaked <laughs> and didn't complain a bit. Eric, you've probably heard that story. Anybody have any questions? Um, ah, Dan, that's awesome that you take your kid, grandkids. I mean, I tell you, there is nothing cooler for me than when we get kids in the boat. Um, man, I love passing on my love for the sport. Um, to kids. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. And we've got, we've got some kids that have been fishing with us a long time and we're able to, uh, you know, watch them grow as fishermen, but also watch them grow as kids um, into, into adults. I mean, we've got, I mean, we've been, we've been doing this for 21 years. So we've got some guys that started out really young that, that uh, shoot, they could be guiding for us now. Oh, well, yeah, it's, it's cool to really cool to pass that on to kids. It's a, something I love to do. And so does Jake, you know, Jake and I both went to college to be teachers. So we both love kids. And we both love to teach. So it's just our classrooms a little different. Um, any questions anybody has? We'll do it again tomorrow. Um, I think we're taking Friday off, but we're doing it again tomorrow and then four days next week. Court, you're the man. What's the, uh, what's tomorrow? I got to start paying attention. Court remembers. I think it may be trout tomorrow, but I don't remember for sure. Trout's something I don't talk a lot about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Eric. Yeah, that, I, uh, that was ugly. If you could see this basement right now and the, and the mess that's going on here, I don't have a whole lot of space. And last night, if you weren't on here, I stood up and blew up this uh, – you know, the whiskey thing and my kids' pictures, I blew them up last night. So that's what he's referring to. YouTube, guys, I'm sorry I couldn't answer any questions. I don't know what the deal was tonight with the live chat. It just says unable to connect chat. Um, obviously, you can shoot me a text. Give me a call. Um, shoot me a, You can shoot me a uh, message on YouTube as well, and I'll, I'll answer it however I can. Hi, Joyce. It's good to see you on here. All right, we'll do it again tomorrow. Thanks so much. I I can't tell you how much I appreciate the messages. So steelhead tomorrow. That'll be fun. So off topic again, but you have any experience with fly craft rods? I don't. Um, I don't have any experience with fly craft at all. If you're looking for kind of an economical rod, um, kind of that low price point. Uh, Tyler, um, Echo makes a nice rod. Temple Fork Outfitters makes a nice rod. Um, obviously, we're with Loomis, and uh, but they don't have that, you know, that under two hundred dollar rod anymore. Um, so I I don't know if anybody else has used Flycraft, but um, Echo and Temple Fork Outfitters on that low end are nice. And Dave uh, Huff, I don't know if Dave's on here tonight, 
the Wolf Rod Company out of uh, uh, either northern Kentucky or southern Ohio, I don't remember which, is a very economical rod. And that would be what I would go with is Dave's rod. So if you want that info, let me know if less Dave's on here and he can reach out to you. So, Matt, um, good question. I, um, so do you think we'll see, he asked, do you think we'll see a explosion of steelhead since nobody's fishing right now and the fish are being able to spawn without being hassled? Um, here's the issue. <laughs> Every day is a weekend. So they are being hassled as much, if not more than ever. Um, there are a lot of people fishing. So every day is a weekend. Nobody, you know, I shouldn't say nobody, but a lot of people aren't working. So a lot of people are fishing. So they are being hassled probably more than more than ever, um, if not, uh, you know, at least as much as ever. So, no, I'm not sure that will happen. It would have been cool if it would have. I was kind of hoping that they would just shut us all down and lock us in our houses but uh, for that reason. But, no, I don't, I don't think it's going to change anything. Um, yeah, St. Joe, which normally I don't see another person on, it's been getting fished pretty hard, and I know the D has too. And I mean, shoot, they've had to close the Manistee down because there were so many people, parts of the Manistee below Tippy Day. Um, yeah, so no, unfortunately, I don't think that's gonna happen, buddy. So, Keith, uh, Dave's out of northern Kentucky, okay, I wasn't sure, but yeah, uh, Tyler, um, yeah, tell him to close it, yeah, <laughs> so all, all fishing, close it down, leave our steelhead alone. Um, yeah, Tyler, Dave is a, uh, he's the guy to go with. If you're looking for that kind of that hundred or under a hundred dollar price point, he makes a heck of a nice rod. He makes a good switch rod too for that money. I've cast that. Um, but that's, that's who I would go with. Get a hold of him. Sorry, you couldn't get on Preston. I wonder what the deal was tonight. I had a couple people say they couldn't get on. Yeah. Wolf rods out of Northern Kentucky. They make a nice. Dave makes a nice rod, and it's in that price point you might be looking at. Um, any other questions? Hey, as always, uh, man, thanks for. My wife should come down at this point every night and thank you that I she keep you guys keep me busy for an hour and uh, you know I, I'm not up bugging her. I should have she should come down. <laughs> yeah, Preston, you know all this. Yeah. <laughs> So I'll give it to you next time over a uh, urban artifact slide rule. I'll do the whole next, the whole last 15 minutes. The last 15 minutes is really all about you. You missed it, buddy. It was your time to shine. <laughs> yeah, court. No, let's not do that. No, nope. just Michigan, not Indiana. <laughs> well, thanks again. Thanks so much. Thank you, Keith. I man, I got so many cool emails and texts today, and I'm glad you guys are enjoying this. Um, tomorrow's steelhead tomorrow might be a little longer um, because we're, we're going to go over a whole lot of information on steelhead from spring to summer to winter and we'll go over a lot so tomorrow might be a little longer um, don't remember what fly we're going to tie tomorrow but uh, it'll be something that's quick and easy so, you're stuck in the hotel for eight weeks oh my gosh Tyler I didn't know that that stinks Thanks, Jacob. We'll see you soon, buddy, on the river. Sorry we couldn't get out tomorrow or Friday, I mean. All right, guys, I'll talk to you tomorrow. YouTube, hopefully we can get questions answered tomorrow. I don't know what happened there tonight, but like I said, if you have questions, just shoot me a text or an email or a message on there, and we'll, we'll get them answered. Thanks again for joining me tonight. Thanks for keeping me company. I'll shave for tomorrow, I promise, Eric. See you guys. Thanks.